Hello class, this is Joseph Holbrook, your professor. Uh, we're talking, uh, doing a survey of Latin America, and we're using uh, great books, classic books, of, from an interdisciplinary perspective, social science and humanities, in order to, as a prism, to peer through to try to understand Latin America better. And this week, we're studying a history discipline and how to uh, understand Mexico and the Mexican Revolution from a historical perspective. So I'm uh, presenting to you John Womack, Jr., a uh, historian from Harvard, who did an excellent groundbreaking historical study on Zapata and the Mexican Revolution, published in 1966. So let me jump into my notes, and we're going to talk. This, these are some actual photos from the Mexican Revolution. They are colorized, which... I like, and so I decided to include them. Okay. Zapata and the Mexican Revolution by John Walmack. This is a picture of uh, Dr. Walmack. He studied at Harvard, and he went on to become a historian and professor at Harvard. And he did his research in the uh, 1960s and published his book in 1966 on Zapata. He was uh, born in 1937. He is an economist and a historian. You'll notice that even though he's focusing on history, that he brings a lot of economic data into his book. He uh, teaches at Harvard University. He specializes in Latin America. His father, John Womack Sr., was also an historian. And uh, he published his monograph on Zapata in 1966 and inspired many other scholars to pursue pursue projects on grassroots rural history. Uh, this is the beginning uh, of a uh, several different genres. Not really the beginning, but it, it's part of several different genres of history studies, which includes peasant resistance. Uh, Scott wrote uh, The Weapons of the Week in the early 2000s. Uh, there's also a genre on revolution, studies of revolution. Uh, that is Scotch Pole. Uh, state wrote on state revolutions and, and peasant peasants and uh, also there is a uh, genre on grassroots social movements three different movement three different genres of historical studies uh, Walmack writes from a non-marxist liberal perspective and has been criticized by some Marxist historian for avoiding the term peasant in his uh, study uh, I want to mention something about micro and macro histories. Uh, this book, Zapata and the Mexican Revolution, can be classified as a micro history. That is, it's a focused historical study on a very specific place and time. In this, in this case, the time is from 1910 to 20, and the place is the state of Morelos. He's not talking about uh, Pancho Villa. He's not talking about the overall Mexican Revolution. He's only focused on the people that lived in Morelos during this time period, and uh, how they related to Emiliano Zapata. So micro-histories can be focused on a very small subject, for example, a village or a city. There have been plenty of histories written about Cartagena, Sevilla, Havana, uh, and they focus on a very specific time and place. A macro-history would focus on the entire Mexican Revolution during this period, and there's plenty of those that have been written. Uh, or it could be a comparative study of the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and the Mexican Revolution. That would be more of a macro history. And so here's an example of a macro history, the Spanish Caribbean and the Atlantic world in the long 16th century by Alda, Ida Altman. So she's focusing on, of course, it's delimited because she's not focusing on the West Indies or the French islands. She's focusing on the Spanish Caribbean islands over more than a century, the long 16th century. Uh, here's a map of the area. You see on the left there, Morelos, the state of Morelos is, is uh, shaded in yellow. It's immediately under Mexico City. You could probably drive from the state of Morelos to Mexico City in a few hours. And this is where this book is focused for our purposes, and then on the uh, on the right there, you see a blown-up map of the state of Morelos. 
uh, below Mexico City, and I have a red arrow in the middle there pointing to where uh, the hometown of Emiliano Zapata was located, Anequilco. And uh, it's a very small village <clears throat> that he was from. Also, the, uh, the town of Ayutla is just below that, and that's where the famous plan de Ayutla was uh, announced. Uh, the Mexican Revolution in Morelos, uh, the Mexican Revolution in general began around 1910 <clears throat> when Porfirio Diaz refused to step down. It uh, devolved into kind of a civil war after the assassination of Francisco Madero, which I think was 1913, but I'm not entirely positive. Uh, Francisco Madero was the the other elite liberal leader who was elected to replace um, Porfirio Diaz. He was a reformer, but not a revolutionary. He was removed from office by a general, Huerta, on the recommendation of the U.S. ambassador, uh, and then he was shot. He was uh, executed by firing squad. I, we don't know if that was the what the uh, American ambassador had in mind. By 19, so from about 1913 to 1917 or 1920, this in some ways could be characterized as more of a civil war among the revolutionaries than a revolution. 1917 was the inauguration of the Constitution, uh, a new Constitution for Mexico, a very progressive document. And the end of the revolution came in 1920. Zapata and the Mexican Revolution by John Womack, Jr., Published in 1966, uh, if you look at the back of the book, which people tend to learn to do when they're in a PhD program for history or other uh, disciplines, you'll find that it includes 22 pages of bibliographic notes on primary and secondary sources, and it has an extensive index. There are also appendices containing a list of major plantations in Morelos, the Plan de Ayula, and the Agrarian Law. Uh, so, Womack documents the gradual loss of communal lands by the people of Morelos. These, are, uh, these lands were held by the villages in common. They were called ejidos, which comes from an Indian word. This was an ancient institution in which the villagers, indigenous villagers, would share certain common agricultural lands and work them together and collaborate in this, in this production as opposed to private monoculture uh, production which was geared to a capitalist uh, network such as in corn or wheat in the United States. Uh, these uh, villages tended to grow more subsistence crops, maybe a few crops to export, and they did it in, in common lands that they held. This institution also went back in England. Have you heard the term the commons? Uh, the English had common lands that were worked by their peasants, their farmers, up until a, a particular time, I think it was in the 1600s, when they began to fence in the lands and to emphasize private property. Now, So I do want to emphasize the fact that this is an indigenous institution, These, this idea of ejidos, or common lands. And they their common lands were getting eaten up by gradually encroaching sugar plantations, which were buying up, trying to force them out, force them to sell, divide up and sell their lands and buy them up for the sugar plantations. So they were gradually being pushed out of subsistence farming and made into uh, paid workers on these sugar plantations, which made them into, in Marxist terms, that would be um, uh, agricultural proletariats. Instead of having their own land to farm for their own uh, subsistence, they had to earn a wage working in the sugar plantations and then they got paid wages in which they could go to the store and buy the things that they used to raise. Um, Emiliano Zapata was the elected representative of the common people. They sometimes are called peasants or indigenous people in the village of Enequilco. Now, uh, these people were descended from the indigenous inhabitants of central Mexico. Many of them may be descended from Aztecs, but they were no longer Indians in the classic sense. They were mestizos. 
That is, they spoke Spanish and they dressed in a Mexican style, but most of them still also spoke Nahuatl. Nahuatl was the common language of central Mexico. The Aztecs spoke Nahuatl. There's lots of people in parts of central Mexico today that still speak Nahuatl. Emiliano Zapata was fluent in Nahuatl. So uh, it would be a bit of a misnomer. You could you could make the argument that they were indigenous, but they were not purely indigenous. Uh, they were mestizos. Uh, a Marxist historian would call them peasants because they were small farmers and uh, poor commoners. Womack uses multiple archival sources to document the process of radicalization of the Moreno's people and their eventual uprising in defense of their lands. Uh, he uses court records, legal documents, legal titles, and uh, archival sources to document his history. The book can feel a bit tedious if the reader is unfamiliar with the place names and the people of Morelos during this period. There's a lot, to, a lot of detail, and uh, you can be familiar with the overall history of the Mexican Revolution, but not know a lot of the names in places that take place in this story. And so uh, this is for a serious scholar, uh, historical scholar. This is not for the uh, the average reader just to read for pleasure. It's for someone who really wants to study Emiliano Zapata and the movement that he led. Oh, I went too far. Let me see if I can back up. I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm sorry. I wanted to be here from the beginning. Okay. Oh, no. That's not what I wanted. Give me a second, folks. Okay, there's uh, some actual pictures of Emiliano Zapata that are colorized during the uh, the uh, Mexican Revolution. So, populism, not Marxism. Womack consistently uses the phrase, the people to describe the fighters and their uh, female followers who followed Zapata, and he avoids the use of the more Marxist term peasants, which implies a certain kind of class consciousness. Uh, one reviewer believes that Womack is using a theory of revitalization movements that was attributed in the 1950s to Anthony Wallace. And there's a citation there for you. His article was called Revitalization Movements, some theoretical considerations for their comparative study. So this is the idea that revolutions revitalize the people who are involved. Um, I haven't studied this theory, but the w reviewer believed that this was the theoretical framework that Wal Womack was using since he published in 1966 and he was doing his research in the 1960s. It's quite possible that a, that a, uh, a theory from 1956 would have been foremost on his mind. The objective of the revolution was utopia, which was nothing more and nothing less than the sovereignty of the general well will of the people in history. And Zapata, the author takes pains to attribute to Zapata as being a representative of the people. Uh, the author talks the first the preface of the book is that uh, the people select a leader. And the epilogue, I, b I believe, is uh, s something similar. But they both start with the people. And so all the way through this book, he refers to the people of Morelos. And that Quilkins never referred to... Uh, I must have misspelled something there. This is a quote from the book on page 7. The Anacuacas never referred to him as Don Emiliano, which would have removed him from the guts and flies and manure and mud of local life, sterilizing the real respect they felt for him into a squire's vague respectability. He was one of their own. They felt in Anacuilco, and it never made them uncomfortable to treat him so. So this is the argument that uh, Emiliano Zapata was a representative of the people, and that uh, he was just one of them, and that he was a, one of the people. The People's Army, uh, this is another quote also from page 7, the liberating army of the center and south 
was a people's army, and to the men who fought in its ranks, and to the women who accompanied them as private quartermistresses, being the people counted more than being an army. Zapatista Utopia. So one of the things that Wilmot talks about is, is kind of a utopian ideal that the Zapatistas were fighting for. In central and southern Mexico, the utopia of free association of rural clans was very ancient. This is the ejido that I was talking about. This goes back before the arrival of the Spaniards and was the kind of the uh, backbone of the structure, economic structure, agricultural structure of the uh, Mesoamerican tribes. The people has revitalized. It has achieved, oh, I skipped a line, in various forms it had moved the villagers long before the Spaniards came. The people has revitalized. It had, notice he uses the people in the singular. It's the people. So it's the people is, which sounds a little odd because you would tend to think the people are, but the people is a singular subject, and he emphasizes this. It has achieved a new steady, steady state that is the end product of uh, Anthony Wallace's theory of revitalization cycle. History has an objective, an end, and which through, the, though the author nowhere says it explicitly, the end must be utopian. Revolution or counter-revolution? One reviewer based on Womack's scholarships question, or he commented on Wolomach's scholarship, and he questioned whether the Zapatistas were really revolutionary. Perhaps the Zapatista movement was a counter-revolutionary rather than revolutionary. This same reviewer says that the, is the one that says that the actual Mexican revolution against Porfirio Diaz was basically over by 1913, and after that it was a civil war free-for-all among the various revolutionaries to see who would come out dominant. Those who sought change, who tried to force upon it such social arrangements as the people did not want, were the revolutionaries. And the Zapatistas and the people of Morelos, in rejecting that revolution, were in fact counter-revolutionaries, according to the interpretation of Mark Mancall in a review essay on Womack's book. Perhaps we assume too easily that the revolution seeks change, seeks to create something new, at the expense of the old. But the Zapatistas were struggling to create something old at the expense of the new. They were resisting neoliberalism. They were resisting Porfirio Diaz's uh, expansion of railroads and factories and sugar plantations and the, uh, the increasingly capitalization of the agricultural field. They were trying to go back to a previous state of sharing, working their crops, subsistence farming, and sharing their common grounds. Uh, but they needed to re regain control of their lands. Here's some other pictures from the Mexican Revolution that are colorized. Many, many women fought in the Mexican Revolution. The same with true of the Zapatistas. Women went to battle with them. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I hope that you benefited from it, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you want to email me. Thank you. Talk to you next week.